Today on Local Connection, we take a trip back in time. Join us as we discover the history of Burnaby. On today's show, the sights and the sounds of the Burnaby Village Museum. Also, kick up your heels and twirl your kilt. The fancy footwork of South Surrey's Highland dancers. And fashion forward. Find out why Vancouver deserves to be on everyone's best dress list. The hair, the makeup, the fashion, the clothes, the chaos of it. See all this and more right now on Local Connection. Hello and welcome to Local Connection, a show about the people and places that make the Lower Mainland such a great place to live. Hi, I'm Darren Storsley. And I'm Stephanie Weeb. We're here at the Burnaby Village Museum. And later in the show, we'll connect with Nancy Stagg, who will give us a tour of the museum. But first, we're going to catch up with reporter Skyler, who's got a great story for us from Vancouver Fashion Week. Oh, and I wonder if he'll find anyone as good looking as a former <laughs> Mr. Canada. Not a chance, right Skyler? <laughs> Nothing puts Vancouver back on the fashion forward list than here at the semi-annual Vancouver Fashion Week. We're here with some amazing designers and hot models. Let's head backstage to find out what all the excitement is about. All the different designs, the new designs and the, seeing the designers, that's, that's the most exciting thing and just the runway. It's a, you always get a rush on the, on the runway. Everything about the hair, the makeup, the fashion, the clothes, the chaos of it. I absolutely love it. I mean, here tonight, you're seeing a lot of great trends, great fashion. I'm enjoying it. Great fashion comes with a fresh face look. We have the Vancouver Fashion Week look, which is very reminiscent of Vancouver. It's glowing skin, very luminescent, bright color for the lips, because I think Vancouver is always so gray. We need to brighten up with some lip color and very definite eyebrows. And then we have a lot of designers that have their own uh, design, their own ideas, and we adjust that look to what they want. The designers of Vancouver Fashion Week are nothing short of unique and innovative. What I do is a lot of uh, like building modification from uh, garments that are kind of tossed to the wayside that aren't really being used anymore. So upcycling them in a way to make them more fashion forward, um, using other materials that some people might not think could have fashion potential, um, like old tape and glue and making them into some, some studs for a jacket. We're crazy excited. We're launching a new brand out of Vancouver. It's being produced down in LA on old world loom Japanese denim and we're crazy excited to bring this to the market. And the concept behind their style? It's denim. The whole thing is, it's, it's art. It's not really clothing the way we look at it, it's art. There's an artist working behind it, so we want to bring that out, and that's what I've done with the jeans. Just do what you do best. It's, it's all about art. You've got to forget the commercial aspect when you're producing a piece. Bring your feelings out. Every piece that I have here has brought the artist's feeling out. The, the people who've worked on it, sometimes they're happy, they produce something great, and they're sad, they produce something great too when they're sad. So that's what we brought out. Well, we've talked to some amazing designers and seen some amazing fashions here on the main stage tonight. And Darren, you may have some competition. We talked to some pretty good looking models backstage. I don't know, what do you think? For Local Connection, this is Skylar Bear at Vancouver Fashion Week. Thanks, Skylar. You know, I think we're actually pretty fashionable here in the Lower Mainland. I don't think we deserve the bad rap we've been getting. What do you think, Darren? Absolutely not, and especially right now, standing in Bell's Dry Goods Store, where they sell fabric and sewing supplies, and Stephanie, especially since you and I look so good right now, I think Vancouver's doing just fine. You know, I agree, and I also think that we do have some of the best food in the area. So, up next, Roxana Olteen brings us some sweet treats from Davie Street. Sounds yummy. If you've ever walked past the corner of Davy and Thurlow and wondered what that wonderful smell was, it was probably this place. Let's go in and check out what they're making right now.
In the heart of downtown Vancouver, you'll find a bakery that is truly the heaven of desserts. People maybe sometimes walk by, but always they feel something special, a special smell. Even if the first entry in our store, they are not buying something, they will always remember that corner of Davy and Tulo, it's the best smell in town. Even with little advertising, the bakery has become a local neighborhood favorite filled with Eastern European desserts. Founded by Narcisa and Alexander Stoyan in 2008, the bakery is the only place in Vancouver to serve Kurtox Kolax, also known as the cone pastry. The making of these um, pastry cones is actually quite a long process. It is. We come early in the morning to prepare the fresh dough and then uh, we leave it for about two hours to rise and then we portion it, 300 grams is the weight of each um, uh, cone and then we roll it in a special way on our cones. We take the dough, we cut it in a special shape and then we roll it on the, on the mold mm -hmm. and then as soon as it is uh, done we spread sugar on top. Sugar will turn to caramel and on top of that hot caramel the walnut in the end. So I would like to thank Narcisa and Alexandru for having us at their bakery, Transylvanian Traditions. You can find out more information about them on their website. For Local Connection, I'm Roxana Oltin. Pofta Vuna! is awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks Roxana and as you can tell we found some sweet treats of our own here mm -hmm. at the ice cream parlor at the Burnaby Village Museum. And it's just one of the many things that you'll see when you come to the Burnaby Village Museum. Here to tell us more about it is Nancy Stegg. She is the marketing director for the museum. Can you tell us what people can expect to see when they come here? Burnaby Village Museum is a step back in time. Uh, we've created a 1920s village for people to come and experience. It's complete with a chapel a blacksmith. We have an interurban tram that will be turning 100 next year. The ice cream parlor, the bakery, the Royal Bank building has been brought in. The real estate building is heritage. The Love Farmhouse, it's the oldest building in Burnaby. Burnaby building permit number one. A ride on the carousel is an absolute must. And all of these are done with a particular flair for Heritage Christmas. That's our next open season, and we open late November. And it's a wonderful experience to come with your family. Well, thank you so much for your info, Nancy. And next time, we have to get you an ice cream cone as well. <laughs> OK. Well, stay tuned, because after the break, we have a guided tour of the Burnaby Village Museum. And this cowboy can't wait for his carousel ride. Don't go away. Also after the break, native culture and impressive totem poles are just some of the stars at the BC Museum of Anthropology. And you don't have a civil right if you don't have a remedy to enforce it. Fighting for the rights of those who can't fight back. The story of Paul Kahn's and Civil Rights Now. Local Connection will be right back. We are kids. Fish kids. 10,000 kids. We are brave. We are strong. We are fighters. Some days are good. Some days are bad. Some of us make it. Some of us don't. My wish will make me strong. The Children's Wish Foundation of Canada. Does a wish make a difference? You bet. You bet. Imagine the difference a wish can make. On my two more needles tell my wish. Please give today. Welcome back to Local Connection. 
Wow, look at all this great stuff. We really have stepped back in time here at the General Store at the Burnaby Village Museum. That's right, and here to tell us more about what we can see here at the museum is Nancy Stagg. Hi, what can you tell us about this place? We've got a general store that sells goods of all sorts for the consumer in the 1920s. A lot of goods in the 1920s came bulk, and of course you would need to weigh out your purchases. This particular scale has a mirror, so it's an honesty scale, so you can check to see whether the merchant is holding the weight down a little in his favor. Now we're in the Elworth kitchen. This was the kitchen of the Batemans and we're standing next to the Housier. And this would be a storage for various supplies and equipment. And this is the ice box in the Elworth kitchen. The ice would go in here. The ice tongs here would be used to put the ice in this compartment. Okay. And then uh, the science experiment is that cool air goes down, you put your ice on top and the cool air filters through the oh, space. Okay. So this is the stove in the Elworth kitchen. It, the kitchen is the hub of any house and uh, certainly the stove would have been the central feature. It creates your heat. So your fire would have been made in here. These would have been your burners per se. And you can have a peek underneath and you can see how your fire is doing. Well, thank you very much, Nancy, for that comprehensive tour back through time. My pleasure. And now to step even further back in time, reporter Maria has something very special for us in store at the Museum of Anthropology. From African, Asian, the Americas, Pacific Island, and to our own British Columbia, the Museum of Anthropology, located at the UBC campus in Vancouver, holds a vast collection of thousands of objects from indigenous cultures. In this museum, there's art from around the whole world, but is it true that you focus mainly on Aboriginal art from BC? Well, we have a, yeah, we have a large worldwide collection, and in fact, one of the largest components of it is Asian material. Oh, yes. But we're best known for the Northwest Coast from the Pacific Northwest. We have the Great Hall with the monumental sculptures, the totem poles that we're very well known mm -hmm. for. And we have a very important historic and contemporary collection of Northwest Coast Aboriginal art. A famous example of that contemporary collection is Bill Reed's Raven Discovering Mankind in a Clamshell. The museum commissioned this monumental version which now sits proudly in the Bill Reed Rotunda, which was built specifically for this piece. So here we see um, the trickster raven, a really important mythological creature in Haida narratives. Um, walking along the beach and he's always looking for food, always looking for adventure and he comes upon this clamshell and hears all these sounds coming out of it so always a very curious character he goes to investigate. So Bill Reed has captured that moment in time right here in this sculpture. Here we're standing in the middle of the Kwakwakiwak collection. So the Kwakwakiwak people from northern Vancouver Island and the adjacent mainland, the, um, that collection is the largest of our Northwest Coast Aboriginal collections. And it's a very interesting one because it's not necessarily an ancient collection, but it's one that um, is very much connected to community and to family still. So much of it came to the museum in the early 1950s, um, directly from families up the coast. This collection is so large that the museum isn't able to display it all. However, with technology called the MOA Cat, you can view the entire collection online at home or from touchscreen set up in the museum. There are terminals throughout the space where you can, with a touch screen, you can find where you are, you can choose pieces, you can select in many different ways and find out what else is known about the piece. So even when things are behind the scenes in storage, you can have a look and see what's there. The museum also features the art of Mary Ann Nicholson. This display is based on bent wood boxes in the Great Hall, but made of glass and painted black. These boxes make a statement about the protection of cultural knowledge and access to it. 
and you have to, as a viewer, you have to come up very close to the boxes and actually physically engage with the work in order to see the images that are inside. The boxes are beautifully etched in the Northwest Coast style and lit from below. Each box features photographs from the 1930s of children, which in present day are now the elders and the holders of knowledge of our time. Why is it so important to preserve all of this art? Um, I would say that this isn't just all about preservation. We have historical collections that are really important because they are still so much connected to living people in communities. Um, Aboriginal people now who are very much connected to the collections here. So they're historical things, but they're also very present today. And then it's very important for us to have contemporary works of art as well to demonstrate the, the living culture, the, the um, Aboriginal people as global people. For more information on exhibitions, public programs and museum hours, you can check out the Museum of Anthropology's website and remember that you can check out their entire collection online. My name is Maria Arias Rosso, here a Local Connection. Thanks, Maria, and be sure to check out the Hiroshima exhibit from now until February. Up next, we meet a man who's taken on the daunting task of fighting for the rights of people who have disabilities. Clayton Timko has our next story. Summer was really, really busy for me, and it's just a blur. Paul Kahn is a busy man on the move. A move for social change, that is. So Paul, tell me some of the biggest barriers people with disabilities in British Columbia face on a daily basis. Well, the biggest barrier can be summed up uh, in a, a phrase lawyers use, which is um, um, a right without a remedy is no right at all. You have no way to enforce the rights you have. You don't have them. That's why the Burnaby resident created Civil Rights Now, a non-profit society dedicated to ensuring voters with disabilities and their rights are heard loud and clear. We have a single purpose, which is to get the law reformed in D.C. so that we have a remedy for our civil rights, so we have a way to enforce our civil rights, and so that uh, people with disabilities can live a life of living dignity. You don't have a civil right if you don't have a remedy to enforce it. To achieve this, Civil Rights Now is on a mission to get laws passed that help to enforce the rights of voters with disabilities. We want legislation that will achieve two things. Any government dollars allocated to uh, help a voter with disabilities should go directly to them, and then they would decide with that money what goods and services they would purchase. Second goal would be uh, government funding of test cases involving the civil rights of people with disabilities. Most people with disabilities are poor and cannot afford uh, effective legal counsel. The goal for Paul and Civil Rights Now is for all voters with disabilities to have equal rights and protection under the law. He leads a team of volunteers who have learnt the hard way that hope is not a plan. What you learn the hard way is, you learn that you have rights on paper, you have civil rights on paper, but you don't have them in practice. When your civil rights have been violated, you don't need a good hug, you need a good lawyer. The contact information is on. According to Paul, most BC voters with disabilities cannot afford a good lawyer and have no way to protect their civil rights, which can cause a number of further problems. Because of that barrier, uh, you can't get access to proper education, proper health care, uh, proper housing. Uh, we can't get uh, criminals who rape and beat, neglect and abuse people with disabilities. Uh, charged or imprisoned, uh, and this has been true for a uh, hundred years. From what began as reaction to abuse Khan says he suffered through the system has transformed into a two-year movement towards bettering the lives of all his fellow voters. We have spoken to hundreds of people with disabilities over the last two years all across the lower mainland. I can feel the momentum building and I can also since the hunger for justice and dignity in the people that I've spoken to directly. And he's beginning to see some progress. The progress we've had in the last years is we have more people supporting us than we had two years ago. Uh, we've been very successful at using social media and media to get a word out that we 
have a long way to go. We're at the bottom of a mountain, Clayton. We have a very, a very steep hill to go up. In Burnaby, I'm Clayton Timko for Local Connection. Thanks for that important story. And make sure to follow up on Paul's progress at civilrightsnow.ca. That's right, and all of today's stories are coming from right here at the beautiful Burnaby Village Museum. And when Local Connection continues, we're going to check in with you, with your stories from your hometown. Also after the break, Platt is back in a big way. The kilt-twirling youth of my hometown of South Surrey. Local Connection will be right back. Welcome back to Local Connection. We're here at the Burnaby Village Museum and beside us is a refurbished tram. As Nancy mentioned earlier, this tram was the one used on the interurban line. Yes, this would have connected Burnaby with other places in the Lower Mainland. But right now this tram is going to connect us with South Surrey as we go to Abby who's going to teach us about Highland Dance. Dance is often a reflection of a culture. Today we bring you Scotland's energetic Highland Dancing. Highland dancing is uh, traditional Scottish dancing that was originated obviously in Scotland. Uh, started probably in the 1700s. Uh, today kids compete and dance throughout Canada and the world. The significance of the sword dance is what was traditionally danced by soldiers on the eve of a battle and if one of the soldiers should displace or touch the sword it was said to be ominous towards the battle the next day. The dancers make it look so easy, but Highland Dance requires a lot of stamina, leg strength and skill. Highland Dancing is very strenuous, uh, the people need to have a lot of endurance, a lot of stamina, a lot of strength, as well as making it still look balletic and graceful. Competitions are a huge part of the Highland Dance world. I enjoy the feeling that you get being on stage and knowing that all the effort and all the hard work you put into it is going to be worth it in the end. And if you do well, then it's just that much better. Some competitions can be really fun and you just have a good time. And other competitions, there can be a lot of pressure. When I first started, it was very nerve-wracking, but after a couple of years, it gets better and you, like, you build confidence and it gets easier. <laughs> we learned that the only way to train for Highland Dance is to just do it. To be a Highland dancer, you have to be determined and want to work hard towards it because it's not easy. But once you do well and you learn everything, then it's, um, it's a good time. Obviously, your outfit is a big part of Highland dancing. Tell me more about it. Okay, so all together, this is called a kit traditionally. And these are soft leather kind of shoes, and they're normally called ghillies. Um, these socks are made of wool. And um, they're very, very thick and hot. And then this is a kilt. Normally there's about six meters in a kilt um, of material. It's also made of wool. And then this is just a velvet jacket. And these little buttons were traditionally made out of silver. Highland dance isn't only fun to watch, but it's also fun to be a part of. If you'd like more information, go to the BC Highland Dance website. Thanks, Abby. Wow, those girls really work hard. Mm -hmm. Almost as hard as this blacksmith here, who is one of the many attractions you'll see at the Burnaby Village Museum. 
But right now, it's time for my favorite part of the show, and that's where we get to connect with you. So let's check in with reporter Dominic to hear what you have to say. Thanks, guys. We've learned a lot about Burnaby. Now it's time to find out what you had to say about where you live. Where are you from? I'm from Winnipeg. Okay, tell me something about Winnipeg that most people don't know about. Osborne Village is the place to go. And what's, what's to do at Osborne Village? Uh, you just hang out with all the hippies. <laughs> Can you tell me something about Prince Rupert that most people don't know about? Lots of seafood. It's on a little island and surrounded by mountains. That's about it. My hometown is Halifax. I don't know! <laughs> Nobody else knows. The blue, well, everybody knows the Blue Nose was built there. And, oh, I know! My grandfather's vehicle was the first vehicle to cross the Angus L. McDonald Bridge. Where are, you, where are you guys from? Montreal. Montreal. Tell me something about Montreal that most people don't know about. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit dirtier than here. <laughs> where are you guys from? Uh, Castlegar. It stinks. We have a pulp mill. Okay. It's, uh, it's a very smelly town, but it's beautiful. Where's your hometown? Quite a good. Tell me about something about Quetico that we don't know about. Uh, it's really small and we only have three uh, lights. Three? There's, no, there's more stop signs than lights. Born and raised where? Dawson Creek. There's something about growing up in a small town. Whenever we do, we say something, someone is not so much like us. We love it. Someone does a good deed. We're like, why are they different than other people? And we're like, because they grew up in a small town. Tell me something about Brazil that most people don't know about. Uh, Brazil has no and cold cities in the south. Uh, Brazil is actually richer than you think. Not everybody know how to dance samba. What can you tell me about Ireland that most people don't know about? It's very beautiful, very... Yeah. And there's no leprechauns in Ireland. No, no. no. Uh, where are you from? Uh, Delta. Originally Scotland. Scotland. Uh, can you tell me something about Scotland that most people don't know about? Well, Ness is real. Where are you from? Uh, Czech Republic. Beer, beer, a lot of beer, drink. Korea has uh, like uh, four seasons. Lots of beautiful women. <laughs> Can you tell me something about your hometown that most people don't know about? Uh, Vancouver was rated the most livable city. It doesn't rain all the time. Well, Americans think we live in igloos, so. To the Americans, we don't live in igloos. Tell me something about Vancouver that most people don't know about. It's so awesome and everybody should come. Thanks, Dominic. And Stephanie, you know they say that time flies when you're having fun. That brings this episode of Local Connection to a close, which means, of course, we're one step closer to our carousel ride. But before we do that, we want to thank Nancy one more time for her amazing tour today of the Burnaby Village Museum. Yes, yeah, so we would like to welcome your feedback. So if there's a story that you would like to see on our show, please visit our Facebook page and check out our YouTube site for past shows. For Local Connection, I'm Darren Storsley. And I'm Stephanie Weeb. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Yeehaw!